Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 1 through 8. Listen and hear God's word. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the peoples of Jerusalem were going to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for your good news and that you draw near to us, dwelling with us through your word that took on flesh. Guide us as we strive to draw near to you, opening our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to your word for us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So for those of you who try to connect the titles of a sermon with the text that is going to be preached, I just want you to know they don't match. This was the second title for this sermon, and now there's a third that's called The Whole Truth. So just ignore what's in your bulletin, but I reserve the right to use that title another time. Friends, beginnings look different to all of us. I remember learning this as an avid Brady Bunch fan in my childhood. My sisters and I were allowed that half an hour of screen time, though we didn't call it screen time in those days, and would run in from playing outside to watch each episode late in the afternoons in the summer. It wasn't long before we realized that although the theme song remained the same, the beginnings were all different, and we started to be able to tell which episode was going to play out in front of us just by the angle in which the Brady family house was shot in the scene. Beginnings look different. I've heard that I was born on a snowy December Saturday in the morning following a Duquesne basketball game that the night before. My own child was born after three days of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for him to come. Just about six in the afternoon, one spring evening. By the time we got home from the hospital, we saw that the, the earth had changed. The grass and the trees were green or full with buds. A new season had begun. Beginnings look different, even in our Gospels. When I was in seminary, I learned these little tidbits I'm about to share with you, and wow, I thought they were exciting. So I hope that the little Bible study you're about to hear is as exciting to you as it was to me. Beginnings look different even in our Gospels. The beginnings of each of our four Gospels do not do more than just introduce us to Jesus or to his earliest days of his life. Each of the Gospels make it clear that each author wrote each gospel with intention and had a different approach to telling the story of the good news. 
each author providing us a different lens through which we might see Jesus. So Matthew, Matthew wants the readers of his gospel to see Jesus as the new Moses, as the one who has come to fulfill the law and the prophets, the one of whom the prophets foretold. Matthew wants his primarily Jewish audience to know that Jesus is indeed a descendant of King David. And so Matthew gives us a genealogy establishing Jesus' credentials, and we hear a birth narrative that is filled with dreams, dreams experienced by Joseph, dreams experienced by kings and other kings who were coming far and wide to worship a new king. Now Luke, on the other hand, wants us to see that Jesus is a liberator, one who has come to not only set people free from their own sin, but also to set humanity free from the sins of others. Luke paints a portrait of a Messiah who welcomes the outcast, who aligns himself with the marginalized, and who disrupts the status quo. And so Luke gives us our first introduction to Jesus through Mary, a poor young girl whom God has chosen to give birth to the Messiah. Angels speak again in this story, but they cry out to women. They cry out to shepherds who are sleeping in fields alongside sheep in the middle of the night. And then there's John, who tells us about Jesus not through stables or dreams or even the guidance of angels. John tells us of a light, a light that entered the darkness, a light that was so bright that no darkness could overcome it. Luke tells us of a word, a word that puts on human flesh and dwells with humanity so that all would know that God was and is with us. And then there's Mark. Mark writes his gospel first with a message of redemption that is so urgent that Mark skips over the birth of Jesus altogether. Mark lets us know that Jesus is coming, but he does not entertain any speculation or any sentimentality about how Jesus got here. He cuts to the chase. He picks up the call of the prophet Isaiah and gives it voice through John the baptizer, who cries out as a voice in the wilderness once again, the Messiah is coming, he is almost here. Get ready now, like right now. Repent, be baptized, prepare. Now I admit, that it is a little disorienting to me to break the chronological trajectory of our Advent journey and jump to John, the baptizer, when Jesus hasn't even been born yet. Liturgically, John will show up again in just a few weeks in our calendar, and although Mark doesn't say anything about dreams or brave decisions and long journeys, he kicks off the story of Jesus' life with John. It seems strange to me to go forward so that we can just go back and get to Bethlehem. But John, like the prophets of every age, are clear. We have got to be ready. John, John in Mark's gospel, makes it clear that the Messiah does not just do the Messiah's work by entering the world but that God's people must do our work too, so that the Messiah can be received by our hearts and our lives. In order for this to happen, we need to make space to welcome him. We need to let go of the baggage that hinders us. We need to repent of our sins, surrender our suppositions, our systems of power to which we submit, and engage in the important work of receiving our Savior. So Mark gives us a beginning that begins with John. 
We need to pay attention to this odd character in the wilderness, wearing camel skin and a leather belt and picking locusts out of his teeth before we can ever find our way to Bethlehem. Mark's gospel is disorienting. I know it's disorienting to me as I try to make space in my schedule and my life to do the things that are required of me to make Christmas happen. As a mom or a wife or a sister or a daughter or a friend, and yes, even as a pastor, there are first grade holiday concerts and high school carol sings. There are lights to hang and a tree to decorate and thanks be to God that tree is pre-lit. There are pajama days at school and who has to find school worthy pajamas? You guessed it. There are pageants at church candles to be ordered. There are traditions to maintain in new ways. There are texts exchanged among sisters to make sure that someone is ordering the oat plucky that we eat on Christmas Eve because dad was the one who used to do that and he can't do that now. I love these preparations. I love how they make me feel. They make me feel connected, connected to my family, connected to my church, connected to my God, even as I am tuckered out and tired by the middle of December and plan to take a good nap tomorrow afternoon to get through the rest of the month. I also just love making the world a little more beautiful. I love making people feel a little more loved. And I love focusing on the incarnation of Christ Jesus. This beautiful offering of God's own self for us by putting on human flesh and dwelling among us, experiencing the humility and the vulnerability of humanity. That gift of God's fills me with awe every time I tell the story, whether, like Sarah said, it is during a conventional Christmas season or a part of any old day of the week. And then on this second Sunday of Advent, John cries out for repentance. John reminds us that this life we share, the life that Christ shared with us, it's a messy one. Kind people hurt other kind people without even knowing it. Cultural and governmental systems use power in ways that are just for some and unjust for others. And we get swept up in the ways of the world, whether we notice it or not. And then John cries out like the prophets before and says to all of us, hey, hey stop it. Repent, confess, be baptized, get ready. God is coming. It is this type of preparation to which John invites us that truly gets our hearts ready as individuals and as a community to receive the gift of the coming of the Christ child. One commentator writes, Mark teaches us to see God by looking to Jesus. But in order to understand Jesus correctly, Mark looks back to the prophets of Israel he sees them then looking forward in anticipation of God's intervention. And when Mark stands with them and looks as they look, he sees John the Baptist in line with them and looking in the same direction. So as Mark looks at John, looking at Jesus, he sees himself in perspective. 
And so with eyes trained by the prophets to look repentively and trustingly to God, then Mark invites us to look for Jesus too. So we look for Jesus. We look for Jesus here at church. We look for Jesus in the hymns and the songs and the prayers and the lights. We look for Jesus in scripture and in our community together. We look for Jesus in our world, for a glimpse of the Christ child in our daily lives, for an assurance that God is with us here and now still. And the beginning of Mark's gospel reminds us, as another commentator states, that the beginning of good news, it happens in the middle of nowhere and not in the center of power. The good news of truth and justice for all will be cried out by the prophets willing to accept all. The truth will be known in the outskirts, in the unexpected places, in the spaces where boundaries have been crossed and that needed to be torn down long, long ago. And so Mark reminds us that the beginning of the good news happens too within us. I guess I have to admit that as disorienting as this is, I love that this is our lection for this Sunday. Just moments ago, the children of the church told us the good news of Christ's birth. And yes, they were dressed as sheep and a star and angels and shepherds. You know the cast of characters, they were all here. Matthew and Luke's Gospels were read by narrators. And yes, the teenagers had their PJs on to tell the story. And baby Jesus was played by Veda. And then as we lit two candles of our Advent wreath, a reminder of that promised light in John's Gospel, the light of Christ that would come into the world a light that will never be overcome by darkness. Charlotte and her moms lit those candles too. And then Veda and Charlotte were baptized here together, two beautiful children who have not yet seen their first Christmas. In faith and love, their parents brought them to the waters of baptism and told the truth of the reality of of sin in the world and the truth of their need too for a savior even before either of these precious girls could even say a word we met veda and charlotte at these waters just as we remembered with thanksgiving our own baptism and we promised to help them out to show up for them and support them on their journey of faith to nurture them so that they might know faith and hope and love before even knowing who they are or what their favorite color might be or their favorite food or their hidden talents. We welcome them as siblings in Christ, as members of this family of faith, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God who has created, redeemed, and sustains them each day. And we welcome them in trust that not only they will be better for their baptism, but we will too, because we will be blessed by their presence among us. And so we participate in the promise of the Christ child, whether gathering at the waters of our baptism or parading down the center aisle as sheep or angels or a star, into a world where there is a lot of messiness, where there is injustice and sin of all kind. God is with us. Into our busyness 
and our brokenness, into our hopes and our joys, and into our grief and our loss. God is with us. Into our courage and our truth-telling. Into the family we form together, God is with us. And so here is the whole truth. There is sin and brokenness in our humanness and we are chosen by a God who loves us in whose image we too were fearfully and wonderfully made. We stand in need of mercy and God's mercy is so wide that God in Christ took on the messiness of our flesh and entered human life so that we might be redeemed. Here's the whole truth. There's a lot we need to do to get ready, to repent, to confess, to draw together, to love, to remember our baptism, and to baptize others. And here's the whole truth. Whether we're ready or not, God is with us. God will break into humanity in human flesh. God will enter creation as a baby. God's Holy Spirit will dwell within us and call us together to incarnate God's word and will too. The whole truth is God is with us always so that we might know God's gracious love. Thanks be to God. Amen.